Good morning. What a delight to be with you this morning in the house of the Lord. When we were at our pastor's conference a couple of weeks ago, one of the joys of the conference is that at each mealtime you get to meet people from literally around the globe. And one particular evening, a rancher from Alberta sat down with us. And he is a bivocational pastor and has been that way for 15 years. And he made a comment. We were talking about the comparisons between farming and pastoring. And the fact that, you know, it's a busy life. It's, a, it's, an on, it's very, very active. And he made a comment. He said, a clean barn makes no money. What that means is the barn's being used. And it's doing what it's supposed to be. And as we have a busy church... That's a sign of life and growth and vitality. Even if there's a few messes that have to be cleaned up eventually, it's a good sign. Because a clean and pristine and sterile building that's never being used means it's not being used to the Lord either. And so we want to be an active church as we obey the Lord Jesus Christ and continually reach out and draw in and disciple. I thought that was a a great uh, illustration. You know, life is messy at times, but God sure is good. And the gospel sure has a solution for all of the struggles that we go with. I really want to encourage everyone, as you can, this week and next, to buy those tickets for that Caring for Women omelet breakfast. Let's be a church that, in large numbers, shows up to support this wonderful ministry. Uh, We all know about Caring for Women, but it's good for us to continue to stand with them because the battle goes on, and we want to continue to stand with unborn children and with their mothers and minister to them uh, as we can. And if you can hang around at 11 a.m., there's opportunities. And the parenting class starts up again today, and I commend it to you. I also want to, for the first time in a long time, give a a shout-out, at Will, for my pastor's class. Over the next several weeks, we're going to be dealing with the question, how do we pray? And so if you can hang around at 11, there's some opportunities for you to get involved in different discipleship ministries uh, here at the Evangelical Free Church. Well, there is a legend in ancient India of a man named Ali Hafid, who owned a very large farm that had orchards and large fields of grain and gardens, and he was a wealthy, contented man. But one day a wise man from the east told him all about diamonds and how wealthy he would be if he owned a diamond mine. And now Ali Hafid went to bed a poor man, Poor because he was discontented this time because of what he did not have. Craving a mine of diamonds, he sold his farm to search for these rare and precious stones. He traveled the world over, spending his fortune, becoming so poor and broken and defeated that he finally committed suicide. And one day the man who purchased the land of Ali Hafid led his camel into the garden to get a drink. And as his camel put its nose into the brook, the man saw a flash of light from the sands on the shore. Checking for the source of light, he reached into the sands and pulled out from, the, from there a stone that reflected all the hues of heaven. And so it was that this man had discovered the famous diamond field of Golconda. which, among other things, has, ho- has been the source of some of the most famous diamonds in the history of mankind. Had Ali Hafid remained at home and dug in his own garden, content with what he had, instead of longing for what he did not, he would have had acres of diamonds. Contentment is an elusive thing. The desire to get ahead, the drive for success, The pressure to rise above the pack are strong. The desire to be allured by what we do not have because we lack contentment with what we do often drives many to the brink of insanity. And in our competitive culture, with constant communication and the constant challenge game that goes on among people, we should not be surprised that with it has come a significant increase in anxiety and other nervous disorders because people do not have peace and contentment. 
Never in the history of the world have we had so much, and never, it seems, have we been so discontented. Well, in the pressure to measure up to others, if we don't properly understand the gospel, it might be that we are tempted to try to measure up to God. We might think, I'm too poor. I don't have enough education. I don't have enough career success. I don't have enough connection to the powerful to be in a, of any use to God and His kingdom work. And so many Christians suffer from the if-only syndrome. If only I were a little richer. If only I were a little healthier. If only I were a little more successful. If only I were a little smarter, then I would serve the Lord. But that mentality, my friends, is a betrayal of the gospel. Because the gospel says that our qualifications are found in Christ alone. And in Christ, we have the favor of God. We have the opportunities that he affords. We have the talents and treasures and time that he has given us to use them for his glory, for his purposes, and for the good of his people. As Paul deals with the church in Corinth, he has to deal with the issue, among other things, of peer pressure and social comparison. And there are at least two main issues that we will look at today in our text that he has to deal with, the problems of ethnic division and social status. I'm not married. Should I be so that I can serve God? I'm not Jewish. Should I be that I might matter to something for God? I'm not powerful or rich. Should I be so that God can use me in his service? These were some of the questions perhaps that the Corinthians are dealing with in their comparison game, one with another. We've already seen how they struggle to follow this leader, to follow that, to dealing with the things of the culture, whether it is political influence, whether it is economic security, or whatever it might be. But Paul will make it clear this morning that God is in control. And the important thing is not one's social status, but one's spiritual state before God. And so when Paul wrote the church in Galatia in 45 AD, he said this, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Jesus Christ. He wrote that in 45 AD. And now writing the church in Corinth just a few years later, he will say something similar as we will see in our passage this morning. We will see that the gospel is the great equalizer and at the foot of the cross, everyone comes at the same level of need and the same need of a Savior. With that as our introduction this morning, I invite you to stand as we look at our passage for this morning from 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 17 to 24. And the God-breathed word says, Only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. This is my rule in all the churches. Was anyone at the time of his call already circumcised? Let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. Was anyone at the time of his call uncircumcised? Let him not seek circumcision. For neither... Circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but keeping the commandments of God. Each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. Were you a bondservant when called? Do not be concerned about it. But if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. For he who was called in the Lord as a bondservant is a freed man of the Lord. Likewise, he who is free when called is a bondservant of Christ. You were bought with a price. Do not become bondservants of men. So, brothers, in whatever condition each, one, each was called, there let him remain with God. Father, as we turn to you now and to your word, we ask that you would give ears to hear and eyes to see. We pray that you would banish distracting thoughts and you would give us focus on you and your open word. Would you open our hearts we pray for your sake and for the glory of Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen. First, we see this morning as you follow along in your outline, sovereign calling and spiritual contentment. We're going to see a lot in this passage about the calling of God. 
and the result that each one should be in the place where he was when he was called. And what is the nature then of this calling that is mentioned eight times in eight verses? Well, the first thing we notice is that this puts God in control. Look at the words. What the Lord has assigned or God called or the position he was in when God called him. As we saw earlier as we began our introduction to the book of 1 Corinthians, back in chapter 1, verses 26 to 31, we saw that God is the one who calls to salvation. He is ultimately in control of all things. And the verb there is in what we call the perfect tense. The reason why that's important is in the Greek language, when something is in the perfect tense, it is something that has happened in the past with consequences that are ongoing and continue into the present. God is the one who calls. And in light of the whole purpose and point of 1 Corinthians where we are comparing the wisdom of man, which wants to think a certain way, and the wisdom of God, which trumps the wisdom of man, we need to be willing to listen to what Paul is saying. God is the one who calls. It is a call that is irrevocable. It is a call that is eternal. It is a call that is unbreakable. It is a call that is irresistible. It is a calling that is individual. Only let each person lead the life that God has assigned to him and to which God called. And this is a very typical way for Paul to talk. In fact, he wants it so much to be seen that he actually puts each person at the beginning of the sentence, which in the Greek means for emphasis. He wants it to be emphasized that each one, each individual, and this idea shows up all throughout the letters of Paul, where he says that God is the one who is calling out individuals from every nation and tribe and language and kindred and making them to be the one family of God. It's what we see when we turn to the book of Revelation chapter 5, where the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, is praised. For he said, for with your blood you purchased out of men from every nation, tribe, language, and kindred. And so by emphasizing the individual nature, he's showing that this is a particular calling. This is a personal calling. This is God, the sovereign one, saying, I want you, I want you, I want you, and calling them out of their spiritual darkness. What that does then, as we see in our fallenness before God, in our sinful state, in our spiritual death, is that it closes our mouths when we stand before a holy God who alone is in control of all things. Some may want to skirt around this idea and say, well, it's just a general call that goes out to all and then each person decides. But my friends, that's not election. That's reaction. And our God is an electing God. From beginning to end, we see it all the way through and that's what we will celebrate. God gets his man and God will win every time. Because as we've seen now, as we've marched our way through 1 Corinthians, the wisdom of God surpasses the wisdom of man. That God is in control, even in the salvation of sinners, offends the wisdom of man. Because man in his wisdom wants to maintain a little island of righteousness for himself, wants to maintain a little bit of self-justification for himself, wants to be able to say, actually, in the final analysis, I made the final decision. But that's not what the Bible says. And it's not what Paul is saying here. I know that the only thing that I brought to my own salvation was my sin and rebellion that made it necessary. I know that the testimony that Paul gave of himself, that he gave of all believers, that he gave of myself, is I was dead in my sins and transgressions. Now, I did make decisions. I chose what pizza to eat. I chose what restaurant to go to. I chose what book to read. But when it came to the things of God, I was unable to choose God because I didn't want God. My sinful rebellion was completely against him, and every decision I made for God was negative. Until... He gave me the new birth, a birth that I could not bring about myself, that I could not do in myself. That's what regeneration means, to give life to that which was formerly dead. I was dead, made alive in Christ. And so the order of things is that God turned me so that I could turn to God. 
Eight times in this passage, we have a clear mention of God's calling that confronts the wisdom of God against the wisdom of man. The Corinthians, led by the wisdom of man, were running after populism, power, prestige, pleasure, career advancement, division. I'm better than you. I have a higher social standing. I belong to this teacher. I belong to that party. And God makes it clear, you didn't amount to much when I called you. Not many of you were wise. Not many of you were rich. Not many of you were powerful. But the gospel takes a while to sink in. And so the Corinthians are still thinking, well, okay, but I've got to do something to increase my status before God, so maybe I have to pursue this path. And over the last several chapters, Paul has been dissecting and taking apart those different paths and showing that that's not what we do in living out the gospel. The calling on our life is sovereign, and our status is changed, and we're moved from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. And we find that we look forward to this great and eternal salvation that God effected in our lives and what God has begun in our lives, He will carry on to fruition. And when we stand in His glorious presence one day, all we will say is, thank you. And know that we did nothing to get there. It will be all of grace. And that's why our praise will be eternal. We are called individually. We are called to contentment. Only let each person lead the life that God has assigned to him. That's in verse 17, and I'm going to jump ahead to verse 20 because there are some similar things repeated there. Each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. Now, when he says, let each person lead the life, we might want to translate it this way. Let each person walk in the way he has been called. Continue in that status that, that God pulled you out of when he put you into the status of his son and grow and flourish there. Because God's grace is sufficient wherever he finds you, it's sufficient for you to walk in the way that he has given to you. And I think what this would do then, if we recognize that ultimately it's all of God, it helps us to stand against the spirit of envy, where we compare maybe the talents we have with one another, or we compare the life situation we have with one another, or we set up artificial human standards, and if we meet our own standards, we say, I'm just a step above the rest. But that takes away that spirit of comp competition, that spirit of comparison. And I think then takes away the spirit of complaining because we recognize that all that we have comes from God by grace. The man who has no shoes will complain and complain and complain again until he meets a man who has no feet. We need to be content with what we have, not continually be driven and angry and envious with what we do not have. Now, Paul would not say, don't make progress, don't grow, don't advance, because he's already commanded that several times, but it's, it's being content where you are in Christ so that as you are developed in Christ, so that as he gives you more blessings, you're keeping it in proper balance that still all we have is what we've been given. Is that not what he said in chapter 4, verse 7? He says, what do you have that you did not receive? And if you received it, why do you pretend as if you didn't? So every talent, every blessing, every opportunity, every gift, every struggle, every challenge is something that he has given us because he knows what's best to mold us into the image of Christ. It calls us to contentment and it calls us to faithfulness. I'm going to first read at the end of verse 18 where it says, This is my rule in all the churches. Paul says, What I say here, I say everywhere. He's not the traveling salesman that gives a different sales pitch in every town. He preaches what he preaches what he preaches everywhere. He knows that this problem of discontentment, this problem of comparison of competition is everywhere. And so he is emphasizing his apostolic authority over the churches in which he serves. He teaches the same thing everywhere. He mentions his universal apostolic authority several times in this letter. We've already seen a couple mentions. We'll see more as we move through. And so this is not an ad hoc response to a one-off situation. This is what Paul preaches. This is the gospel he was given from the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we get to verse 24. So, brothers, in whatever condition each was called, let, there let him remain with God. 
Remain there, the idea of continuing in it, abiding in it with the idea of being faithful in what you have, not waiting to get what you hope to have one day, and then in that sense you will start to serve God. In popular vernacular, we might just say it this way, bloom where you are planted. There is a whole world that needs to be reached for Jesus Christ. There are still almost 3 billion people in the world without a viable witness to Jesus Christ. We still have the command of God to take the gospel to the four corners of the world. But in that, we need to be faithful to what we have been given, to where we have been called, to what we are to do, because God is the one that's in control. So I love preaching the gospel. I love the fact that God has sent me to different places over the course of my life. But I love more the fact that it's it's all about Him. He's in control. He's the Father. He's the one that I will stand before one day and just give it all back to him. He's the one, Jesus Christ, who said to me after, he said to the apostles what he says to us, after you have done everything that you can do, you're still worthless servants is what he said. The context is not so much that we don't have value. The context is, remember, I'm Lord and you're not. And as long as we keep that relationship in order, we're going to be just fine. We serve the master but we need to get over the comparison game. We need to rejoice with those who rejoice. If people have gifts, opportunities, talents that we don't have, be glad that we're part of a body where those gifts are available. There's a reason why the gifts are dispersed so that we are interdependent upon one another so that we really do need to walk together because one of us can't get the entire job done. In his book, Waking from the American Dream, Don McAuliffe writes, During World War II, England needed to increase its production of coal. Prime Minister Winston Churchill called together labor leaders to enlist their support. And at the end of his presentation, he asked them to picture in their minds a parade which he knew would be held in Piccadilly Circus, a famous place in the center of London after the war. First, he said, would come the sailors who had kept the vital sea lanes open. Then would come the soldiers who had come home from Dunkirk and had defeated the armies of Germany and Africa. Then would come the pilots who had driven the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force, from the sky. And last of all, there would be a long line of sweat-stained and soot-streaked men in miner's caps. And someone would cry from the crowd, and where were you during the critical days of our struggles? And from 10,000 throats would come the answer, we were deep in the earth with our faces to the coal. Not all jobs, responsibilities, ministry opportunities are prominent or glamorous or glorious. But if you have been called by God to them, then let him find you with your face to the coal, doing what you are called to do. Because if you don't do it, it will show up sooner or later. Let there be contentment in the calling that you have received from God, for there's a sovereign calling and there is spiritual contentment. Next, we see that Christ conquers culture. The Lord in his majesty breaks down the myriad of divisions that we build up because of our backgrounds, because of our cultures, because of our histories, because of our philosophies, And he calls people from everywhere and every ethnic group and forms them into this great family that we know as the church, the body of the redeemed. And Paul tells us that Christ breaks down those barriers. And he has to do it again here in the church in Corinth. So Paul says the gospel is for the Jews and the Gentiles. And our text says, Was anyone at the time of his call already circumcised? Let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. Was anyone at the time of his call uncircumcised? Let him not seek circumcision. It was a very common way in Paul's way of thinking and in the age of Paul to divide the world into two, the Jews and the Gentiles, the Jews being the circumcised, all of the Gentiles being the uncircumcised. He starts off by saying, were you a Jew when you were called? Were you one of the circumcised? Did you follow the laws of Moses? If so, don't try to cover up your status. You might think, well, that's an unusual thing for Paul to say. But we need to understand this is Corinth. And so the Jews were living in Gentile areas, and perhaps in their desire to advance and be promoted culturally, they would want to hide, it clearly says, to remove the marks of circumcision. 
It helps us if we understand the culture. You see, back then, the, it, it was not common for homes to have individual baths, toilets, showers. And so there were common community baths. And you can even see some of them if you go visit the Middle East today. You can see where some of these remains of past bathhouses, if you will, were. And so because they were common, you would be noticed. In addition, in the athletic events of the times, the, whether the Olympic Games, the Corinthian Games, whatever they call them at that time, it was very common for athletes to compete in the birthday suit that they were given. And so Paul is saying, you're too worried about the outward appearance. You're too worried about the exterior. You need to worry about the inner change that, that happens with the new birth, that happens with the, when the Spirit of God works in you, and not so much on the outward appearance. To those that were the uncircumcised, in other words, the Gentiles, they were not to seek to become like the Jews. That's the problem of what we call the Judaizers. It's the problem that Paul had as he went all throughout the Roman Empire bringing the gospel. It's what the book of Galatians is about, confronting these Judaizers who say, in order for you to become a follower of Christ, you must first become a follower of Moses. And you have to circumcise yourself and put yourself under the law. And Paul says, that's not the gospel. The true children of Abraham are those who have the true circumcision because of the new birth in Jesus Christ. And so whatever their social status was, whatever their religious status was, at the time that they were called to faith and repentance, Paul reminds them to keep their eyes on Jesus Christ and not on their cultural identities, not on their ethnic situations. Yes, in Christ our spiritual status will change. But now our identity is fully in Christ. That should be the first thing that comes out of our mouth. Who are you? I am so-and-so, a follower of Christ. Because that will be our identity forever in the new heavens and the new earth. And so as we've been looking at these different challenges now, how to live out the gospel through the first Corinthians up, up till now, Paul is saying, well, whether you're married or you're unmarried, stay in the status that you are. Now, we'll get to some exceptions later. If you're a Jew or a Gentile, if you're a man or a woman, if you're free or slave, God is calling all types of people, all kinds of people, to make them members of one body and one family, and the gospel overcomes every ethnic, cultural, religious, and political division to his glory. Because the gospel is all of God, and the gospel is all of grace. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision. Now think about who is saying this. This is the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul who had the equivalent of perhaps multiple PhDs in theology. He knew the history of Israel. He knew the Old Testament. He knew the theology. He was zealous for it. He wanted to persecute the gospel because of it. And now he comes to this church that he's planted and he has to write to them and he says... Neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision. This Paul who, when he writes to the church in Philippi, boasts of his long pedigree of being of the tribe of Benjamin and circumcised on the eighth day and, and being a Pharisee of Pharisees and having this wonderful religious upbringing now says circumcision doesn't matter. He knows that circumcision was the sign of belonging to the covenant of Moses. And so at that time then, there were God-fearers, these Gentiles that believed in the promises of the word, but did not take that next step of circumcision because they, didn't, they, they found it abhorrent, so they could not join the commonwealth, as it were, of Israel because they would not get circumcised. To them, this is good news. He says, don't Try to change your religious or ethnic status, but depend upon the gospel. The law was given to the people of Israel after they had been redeemed, after they had been led out in the exodus from Egypt, and they were obligated to keep it to show that they were redeemed people with the rituals and sacrifices and the moral law. They found it impossible to do so because they misunderstood the ultimate intent of the law. No one was ever going to be saved by keeping the law. 
It was intended to show how the redeemed were to live. But by trying to live according to the law, and they continually failed, it pointed forward to the need for grace and the one who would be the ultimate fulfillment, the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul knows this when he told the church in Rome that Christ was the fulfillment of the law. He also knew that according to the law, even circumcision itself had a physical meaning that pointed to a deeper spiritual truth, and that is true circumcision was of the heart. It reflected the brokenness of sin, the need of repentance, turning away from sin to God because there is a heart that has been made new by the Holy Spirit of God. Paul himself said this to the church in Rome, for no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is, a, nor is circumcision outward and physical, but a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart by the Spirit, not the letter. The new covenant in Christ eliminates the previous classifications of ethnic and religious identity because the true circumcision is not the cutting of the flesh. It is the cutting of the heart by the Spirit of God as the Spirit of God regenerates a person, gives them new birth in Christ, and as a result, they turn and repent of their sins, turning away from the world, turning to Christ. It's a divine heart operation that is necessary to enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said, you must be born again. Well, if the gospel is all of Christ, it also has results, and that is the gospel leads to obedience. So he has just said, for neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but keeping the commandments of God. And the result is we now read the law with a new set of lenses. We read them now through Christ, who Paul has said is the goal of the law. He told the church in Corinth that the law, uh, at church in Galatia, that the law was to lead us to Christ, like a tutor, showing us our need of grace. And so what's the result then of the gospel that has gripped someone's life, that has brought about this new birth? There's a new nature, there's a new identity, there's a new power, there is a, a newness of life. It will be obedience to what God tells us to do. But that brings up the question, what are the commandments of God that are referred to? Is he, is he reverting back to the law of Moses itself, which requires circumcision? Is he talking about the moral law, those aspects of the law that are binding on all people for all time? Is he talking here like he will in other places about the, love, the law of Christ, which motivates us to live and love Christ in obedience to him? I think it helps for us to remember where we are in the context of 1 Corinthians. He has been talking now for a couple of chapters about the expected moral behavior of the one who has been set apart in Christ the expected life transformation that happens when somebody embraces the gospel. And so it does not seem the problem here is an ethnic background, but ethical and moral behavior that is expected of believers. And he's told us, flee from sexual immorality. Flee from idolatry. Live in a manner worthy of the gospel. You, he has called you and set you apart as holy. Now live out in that holiness. Live out as a people who have been set apart for God and for His holy purposes. And so I think many of the commands of God that are given here have been given by Paul already in this book. So we ask, well, Paul, do you speak in a double-minded manner with a forked tongue? Is this something that you just say to the church in Corinth, or is this something you say everywhere? And we can see very clearly if it, if, which is which by looking at how, what he said to the church in Galatia. For in Christ, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. The impact of the gospel will show itself in a transformed moral and ethical life. It will show itself in the transformed way in which we use our time, talents, and treasures. It will show itself in how we actually make decisions, how we use our lives, how we interact with one another, how we respond in difficulty and challenge. Faith working through love. Faith and action, obeying God and doing that which is required by God's commandments. Later on in the same book, to the same church, he would write, For neither circumcision counts for anything, neither uncircumcision, but a new creation. So whether it's faith working itself through love, or a new creation, or as we have here, 
keeping the commandments of God, you see how they all flow together. A newness of life re resulting in a new way of living because there's a new master, we're under new ownership, and there's a new way for us to be living. Christ conquers culture. There will not be this division, at least as I see it reading through all the book of Revelation with the scenes in heaven of the African section and the European section and the American section. I don't see that in Scripture. I see just this multitude worshiping the Lord in the fullness of His glory forever. I don't see the Baptist section, the Methodist section, the Evangelical Free section. What I see is a number that no one can count coming from every language, tribe, and family, standing before the Lamb and in front of the throne, worshiping Him forever. Christ conquers culture. And lastly, we see the freedom to serve Christ. The one who has been born again by the Spirit of God is now a follower of Christ and under new management and under new direction. But first we see from slavery to freedom. Each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. Were you a bondservant when called? Do not be concerned about it. And so he begins by asking, were you a bondservant? And so we need to ask our question, what, the question, what does this mean? Is it just another way of saying slavery? And if it's another way of saying slavery, how does it compare to slavery as we have known it in our dark past as Americans and Europeans? Well, in ancient Rome, people could become bond servants for any number of reasons. They needed to pay off debts. Perhaps they needed work. So they sold themselves out as a bond servant. Perhaps they were a prisoner of war. What was clear was this was something that was common to all peoples. It was not driven by race. It was not driven by discrimination. The sad fact is that some, using this verse... And using verses similar to it in the Old Testament sought to give some type of biblical support to the transatlantic chattel slavery of the 1800s that happened in Europe and the United States. And we need to be honest and say they were misguided. And that was a wrong use of Scripture when we look at the fullness of Scripture from beginning to end. There was slavery in the Old Testament. But what was practiced in the 1800s was not what was ordained in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, there were safeguards, there were protections, there were time limits, there were payments, there were, there were other things that were allowed. It was not just driven by a misunderstanding of the differences of melanin in people's skin. And so we need to be willing to admit it. Now, it's, it's gone, and we need to move on, and we have moved on, and there's been a tremendous amount of healing but let it serve as a warning to us today that maybe we can be blinded by our own cultural expectations. That maybe we are in need of a continual correction of the Word of God for what we take to be just the American way may in fact not be God's way. So we can learn from the past not to repeat the same sins, but let's not use it as an excuse to commit new ones. Because we're part of the community of saints from the first generation of Christians till now and we can learn from one another in our understanding of the Word of God. As Paul would have been writing to the church in Corinth, at probably about one-third of the city of Corinth would have been bondsmen, slaves. About one-third would have been freedmen. And the rest would have been just free men. And there's a difference between freedmen and free men. But the, these bond servants would have to work until they'd paid off the debts or until they were released through what's called manumission, the release from slavery and set free. But until that time, they had no legal rights. I'm not saying all was rosy. It was not, though there were many, 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 many more rights and protections than we sometimes have seen in the history of slavery in the past and I will say even today, going on in the Arab Middle East where there is a continual slave trade of black Africans. But in the bond servant way of doing things in first century Corinth, you would, you, would sell, you would sell yourself as a bond servant for a certain amount of time, and during that time you had no rights. You couldn't marry. You couldn't keep your property. You couldn't accumulate except to pay down the debts. But if you became the property, that means you could also become the property. 
And so there was abuse of all kinds going on. And so when Paul tells them, do not be concerned about it, there's a context to it. He has just told them that they are to flee immorality. He's told Christians to flee immorality, to set themselves free from the ways of the world. But what if you're a slave? What if you're a bondsman, bondswoman? You might still be treated as a plaything by your owner, against your will, involuntarily. And that's part of what Paul is saying is, do not be concerned about your status before Christ. If you are a victim of abuse, you are not guilty. They are the ones that are guilty. Don't worry about how you stand before Christ. God sees the injustice that you are suffering. But if you can get out of it, get out of it. And work to get your freedom. That strikes us as odd today, but we don't live in first century Corinth with the injustices and the immorality that was rampant. But we feel the pain then of these people who have come to hear of the gospel of Christ. This did happen as well in our own country where slaves came to Christ, but were not given the full rights in Christ. Paul says, you're okay with God if you're a victim, an involuntary victim of all kinds of injustice. And it might be that you need to stay in that situation for a while. And if you do, identify with Christ who himself bore injustice of all kinds, even though he would have had the right to send legions of angels to strike them, identify with Christ, and you are secure in him. But if you can get out of it, get out of it. And so Paul continues then with this line of exceptions that he gives to the teachings that he has given in chapter 7. He gives the law. He says, this is what must happen, except... Stay where you are if you have to and serve, accept. And so let's look at some of those things that he would talk about. In chapter 7 and verses 3 to 5, he said, Married couples are to stay and be committed in an intimate relationship with one another, except for an agreed upon time of prayer and developing your relationship with God. In chapter 7, verses 8 and 9, that people that are unmarried are to remain as they are, except if they are burning with passion and would sin if they didn't get married. Verses 10 and 11, he talks about separated spouses. These are among believers. He says, remain separated except you be reconciled with your spouse. In verses 13 to 15, he says, those who are believers but whose unbelieving spouses have left them, they're to stay married except if the unbelieving spouse has left them, then they are free to remarry. Later on in in chapter 7 at the end, widows are to remain as they are except if it would be to a believer and it would be the will of God. And so here in chapter 7, verse 21, it's the same thing. Remain as you are except you can buy your own freedom and get out from under the bondage of your master. But what was interesting in how this worked is you would fulfill your contract and you'd become a freed man. You would get what's called manumission. You were released from your slavery, but you often remained in a relationship to your former owner because you didn't have anything else, but now the status would change. Once the payment was made, there was a change in your status, and you became a freed man, but you often remained in relationship to your former owner. But instead of being a master or a bondservant, you are now treated more as a son, someone in the family. In fact, it was very common in the days of Paul when a freed man died, he would have engraved on his tombstone the freed man of Mr. So-and-so. That this change in status in the relationship would be reflected. And so Paul tells those who were in the Lord when he called them, but they were a bond servant, they are now the freed men of the Lord. And even if they weren't freed men politically, or economically. They are now freed men in the Lord because they are free from the bondage of slavery. I'm sorry, of spiritual slavery, the bondage of sin. They're now identified with a new family. They're part of the family of God with the sonship and brotherhood that they have. And so I think Paul would interject at this point today and he'd say, it's not a question of whether we are a bond servant, but whose bond servant are we? Who is your master this morning? Sin is a terrible master. It will abuse you 
at every turn. The world is a terrible master. It'll use you for a season and throw you out as soon as you are no longer useful. The self is a terrible master because we don't even understand ourselves. But Jesus Christ is a marvelous master. And to be his freed man, to serve under his leadership is freedom and joy and eternal life and the greatest joy there is. Well, if we've seen from slavery to freedom, we now see from freedom to service. Likewise, he who was free when called is a bondservant of Christ. But he will remind them that it's not their, spiritual, their, their social status that is important. It is their spiritual status. You may be a free man, and that you're not under the mastery of any human owner, but you may still be a bondservant of sin and of the world. But those who have been set free in Christ have a new master, and they're now a freed man of the Lord, in whom there is no independence, but great and joyful dependence, where we can serve the Lord, and serving the Lord is better than any service we could do in, the, in this world and its passions. I think Paul picks up on what the psalmist says. He says, for a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the house of the wicked. We have been set free to serve, set free to joyfully serve under the master of the Lord Jesus Christ and not be fixated on ourselves, but to serve him and his people and his great global cause. In 1878, William Booth was at the height of building the, the Salvation Army in England and eventually in America, and there was a, an American, Samuel Brengel by name, who left to go visit with him to join his army. He wanted to be a bishop. And so at first, Booth was very hesitant to accept Brengel. He told him, he said, you've been your own boss for too long. And so in order to instill humility in Brengel, he set him to work cleaning the boots of the other volunteers. Brengel was discouraged, and he said to himself, have I followed my own fancy across the Atlantic in order to polish boots? And then in a vision, he said he saw the Lord Jesus Christ over the, bending over the rough, unlettered fishermen in their feet. And he said, Lord, you wash their feet. I will polish the boots. In Christ, we are free, but free to serve others as his servants. And finally, we see Christ's price, your freedom. You were bought with a price, Paul says. Do not become bondservants of men. He said earlier in this work that we are bought at a great price. He'll say it again. But he, even if he has to repeat it, it's because we need to hear it again and again. You know, the people of Israel were in slavery in Egypt. And God redeemed them. He set them free. And then he gave them his commands that they might walk in his ways. But they failed in that exodus. But that exodus pointed to the need of a greater exodus. And that exodus is Jesus. As Jesus was going to the cross, the writer of Luke says, and Jesus in his exodus went to the cross paid the price for our redemption. He set us free. He forgave us. He set us apart. And we are now his bond servants, and he has left us his commands that we might walk in them, that we might live for him, that we might serve him. But we are not to use our freedom to become servants of the flesh, servants of human beings, servants of human ways of doing things. And so we're not to be put under the mastery of sin again. As Paul has been walking us through this passage and through 1 Corinthians, he reminds us that God is in control, that in any and every situation he is good, and that Christ is our master. Therefore, we're to live in the way that he wants us to live. And I would say this, it's a good thing to be a slave, a bondservant of Christ. So we're not to walk in the ways of the world, but walk in that way. And whatever 
your social status might be. Serve him where you are and let your light shine. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we turn to you now and we say thank you. Father, we know that if really we were in control, we would cause a complete mess of everything. And so we are so glad this morning that our lives are in your hands. And that's a good thing. And we want to joyfully serve you as your servants. But Father, we also need you to lead us to repentance. Because I know, Father, that my heart often is cold. I know, Father, I often want to do things my own way. Forgive me, Father. Forgive us for thinking that we can outwise you. And so this week, would you teach us in a deeper way and instruct us what it is to be truly free men and women, and that is to be the bondservants of Christ. And may you find us serving you well and giving you glory because that would be to our joy and benefit as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.